So good evening once again, everybody. We have now officially started going out live on Facebook, going out live on LinkedIn tonight, going out live on Twitter and on Twitter's video platform Periscope as well. Um, remember when I first started these broadcasts off like four or five years ago and we just went live on Periscope? Like Facebook Live didn't really exist. Um, neither did it with LinkedIn Live, definitely didn't exist. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for watching on whatever platform. If you are watching on the replay or you're listening to the Acts on This TV audio experience on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher, hello to you. If you don't know that that even exists and you want to listen to the audio of all of these live broadcasts that I do every Monday night on Facebook, um, then get yourself over to Spotify or, or Stitcher. That's another pa- uh, like podcasting platform. Um, or uh, SoundCloud or Apple Podcasts. And just search for Act On This TV, all one word, hit subscribe, and you will get the audio of all of these live broadcasts delivered to your device for free um, every week. So I'll go live on a Monday night. The audio for this will probably be uploaded tonight, you know, what after this, because I'm busy tomorrow. So uh, I will stay up a little bit later tonight and I'll put it online so uh, those who missed live can uh, catch up on the audio. Um, So this is the first broadcast of February um, 2020, 2020. Um, give a shout out to those who are joining now. Liz Thompson's just here. Gary's here. Michael's in the house. How you doing? Um, Sal Deeks here. Uh, Mike Ellison, Luke Richards. How you doing, mate? Uh, Alex Garrett, Carrie Dexter, Claire, Julie, uh, Karen has joined now. All these people, listen, all these people joining live. And if you lot are watching on the replay or listening, you are missing out. Um, so, yes, yeah, the first time that we are live in February 2020. Um, and I saw something this morning. Now, I don't know if someone's coined this recently or whether you've heard it before, but I thought it was pretty clever. So I've stolen it. Um, <laughs> I would highly recommend anything you see other people doing as an actor, particularly performance wise, um, that you think is clever. Um, steal it because they've probably stolen it from somewhere else anyway um, in terms of performance you know little things that they do in scenes to make them uh, particularly the good actors um, but someone put this morning I saw Feb Uary so I know it's not spelled like that but Feb U capital Y O U Ery and I thought actually that's pretty good isn't it um, we've got through January, we've got through Blue Monday, we did a live broadcast on Blue Monday a couple of weeks ago, it's supposed to be the most depressing day of the year. Now February feels like, right, the year's really started, so I thought, what can we do tonight to focus on ultimately like investing in ourselves, what can you do to invest in you, right, no one else, um, in order to progress your acting career for, you know, much, much further this year in 2020, um, and that might sound selfish, right, but hear me out. I all, I believe, and I and I practice this right. And you might think, God, Ross, you're an absolute bastard, right? But you've got to put yourself first before anybody, because if you don't do that, you are not going to be of use to anybody, right? So, and I mean that in terms of your family. It might seem really ridiculous, like, oh, you know, my kids have got to be the most important thing in the world. You are useless to your children if you are not in a good place. So you've always got to put you and self care, self love. I know it sounds a bit out there and a bit hippie, um, first. Because you've got to be selfish in order to be selfless. That's my philosophy. It's like, listen, if I am not putting my oxygen mask on as a human being and as an actor, I cannot be of any use to any other human beings or any other actors because, you know, it's like what they say on the aeroplane, isn't it? If the oxygen masks fall down, don't put your children's oxygen masks on or anybody's until you put your own on because you are no use to anybody if you are unconscious. So I started thinking of the content I've been creating over the years on actsonthis.tv, there's 10 years of it. This is the 10th year of actsonthis.tv. And if you don't know what that is, guys, and maybe you are watching for the first time, apologies for those of you who are here every single week. Um, but I'll go over to the website now. It's a website that I've ran for the last 10 years. Uh, there's over 200 hours worth of incredible acting career advice from the biggest casting directors, agents, actors, writers, producers um, in this industry. I've got some freaking incredible podcasts coming out this month, actually, as well. I just recorded one. I mean, there's so much on here already. Uh, there's Dan Winch, ITV executive producer of a brand new ITV drama called um, Ri- uh, uh, Quiz. They said Risk. It's not Risk. It's because it says Risks in the title. Um, quiz, um, based on the cheating scandal on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. He came around for an incredible podcast all about exec producing, casting from an executive producer's perspective, because ultimately the exec producers are employing the casting directors, guys. So in your head, as an actor, you might think that um, casting directors are the most important people in the chain. They're the people who you should be networking with. Um, yes, that's very true. Uh, they're not the most important, though. Um, I don't think anybody is more important than anybody else. But exec producers, uh, people who are calling all of the shots, are definitely worth 
networking with, meeting, offering value to, and getting to know. So Dan came around for a two hour, I think it was over two hours, that podcast. Um, you can listen to an on this.tv, along with loads more. There's me. I, I did a podcast where I actually got interviewed on my own podcast, a bit weird, um, but it's because it's the 10th year. There's Peter uh, Hunt from Hollyoaks. He talks all about um, casting. There's just so many people on here. If you need an agent, I've got loads of podcasts with agents. There's Brian and Nicola from Regan Talent Group, incredible agency. Um, Steve Everts, he's a legend. That's the only podcast I've ever created with a sensor thing at the start of it. Um, look, I'll show you. You won't be able to play it properly, but look, I had to put that at the beginning. This video contains strong language and profanity. It may not be suitable for children and sensitive adults. Um, so ultimately, yeah. Um, I've been thinking of the content that I've been putting out on that's on this TV and how that ties in with Feb U Eri. Okay, so I'm going to play you guys some things tonight that regardless of whether you remember the website or not, you've got to be a member to get access to all that stuff. But, you know, this is not a sales pitch. It's not why I do these uh, these broadcasts. I'm going to give you guys some value tonight. I'm going to tease some things that are coming up on AtsOnThis.tv. And then we're going to do some Q&A as well. So hopefully it's uh, it's going to be useful. Uh, before we start, how was January and February? Like January been for you? Now we're in February. How has it started? Anyone had any exciting auditions? Anyone landed any work? Um anyone got a new agent or anything like that, um, do uh, do let us know. Lots of people in the comments are saying they're looking forward to uh, the Dan Dan Edwards one or the Dan Winch one. Dan Winch, Claire saying, was great. He's the exec producer. I had Daniel Edwards round, the cast and director for Line of Duty on Saturday. We recorded nearly the longest podcast. He holds the record for the longest podcast I've ever, I've ever recorded. We nearly did it again. It was two hours and 41 minutes. The broadcast, uh, the live podcast, uh, the light. It's not a live one. It was kind of live because we were phoning actors on the on the podcast as well. Um, but it's all recorded and that will come out at the end of this month. I've got another one coming out next week with uh, an actor called Dean Smith and Gary Damer. Dean's in Still Open All Hours with David Jason. Talk all about that. I might even play you a little clip of that at the end of uh, at the end of this. But yeah, how's it all been for you? Everybody's year started well. Josh said, saw you on The Stranger. Thanks, man. Um, the Strange is a new Netflix exclusive, a Netflix original. Um, it's made by Red Production Company, Harlan Coben, incredible world-famous novelist. Um, it was based on his book, The Stranger, Danny Brockelhurst, um, turned it into a screenplay. Um, Hannah John Kamen stars in it with uh, Richard Armitage. Lots, It's got an incredible cast. And uh, I, yeah, basically got a little cameo. I was at the read-through, get invited to lots of read-throughs of scripts, and... Um, tongue-in-cheek I was like is anyone going to write me a scene in here with Hannah John Kamen because I'd love that and I mean like it was it was kind of a joke but it wasn't I was like it wasn't a joke um and to cut a long story short yeah that scene that, that you've seen me in um on The Stranger Josh wasn't in the script mate they wrote that um very so kindly um to give me something to do I was like absolute it's just honestly lead with value in your life when you just give with no expectation of anything in return um, magical things happen things get good very very quickly whereas if you look at this industry as what can you take from it you just don't get anything um, just go out meet people network and uh, and give as much as you can with zero expectation of a return and you will get more than you could ever bargain for Paul Dupree hope everyone is well hello from LA Paul amazing to have you here mate um, appreciate you tuning in from the States that's wicked we're getting more and more US people which is good you know what the UK industry works a little bit differently to the US industry in terms of managers and agents and stuff like that but you know what in terms of the psychology and the mindset behind walking in the room and actually getting that job it's exactly the same and um, so so much of the stuff that we record on that's on this TV yes it's based on UK people UK actors UK productions um, but it's just as applicable. Ninety percent of it is just as applicable. And um, so the first thing I wanted to I wanted to play for you tonight. Yeah, I'm going to play some little clips out from podcasts I've done in the past. They're only like one minute, two minute clips, but I just think they're quite interesting, and hopefully it's going to set you up for a good February, where you just start investing in yourself this month. And I put an email out to the email list this morning. I don't know if you guys got it. Anyone in here got it? It was a clip from Julie Hesmond House. Julie is an incredible actress, British actress who got over here in the UK. Um, she was very uh, well known for a part she played as a character called Hayley Cropper um, in Coronation Street many years ago, but she was in it forever. Um, I thought that was where she was going to stay. And uh, and then she left. Her character got um, got killed off. Like I think it was pancreatic cancer. It was one of the most moving storylines I think the show has ever seen. And since then, she's gone on to do incredible dramas. We've got an, I an ITV drama over here called Broadchurch with David Tennant. Livia Coleman did very, very well. Um, she was in Doctor Who as well. And she came around for a podcast. And we just talked about, like, ultimately... 
a lot of like just human stuff, to be honest, in terms of just how her leaving Coronation Street affected her life and, and you know, how she really struggled. You know what? Listen to that podcast. She said, when I came out of Coronation Street, no agent wanted to know her. You know, you lot who are struggling for agents right now. She'd been in one of the most iconic shows on British TV for decade, over a decade, I think. Um, left it, not a single agent would meet with her. Nobody wanted to know her. Um, and it just took a, a shitload of perseverance um, and humility to go, you know what, I'm going to have to perhaps at least start again and convince people that I am not just this character that was in this in this soap opera. Um, so she talks all about that, but she also talks about the secret in her head to happiness. And I know a lot of people will have been watching the BAFTAs last night and it does two things. O over the years, it, earlier on in my career and at certain times, if I've not been doing as well as I would like, watching award ceremonies like that does two things for me. Sometimes it will really fire me up if I'm in a good place and it will make me like, yeah, come on, you know, celebrate everyone else's success. This is all great. And then um, to be completely truthful, you know, times in my life, when I go back to like my mid-20s, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and I was not anywhere near where I wanted to be. I was hitting my head against a brick wall. I was doing everything wrong. I was signing with agents that weren't right for me. They were, <laughs> a few of my agents literally folded and just went bankrupt, so that was bad. Um, that's not a good agent to sign with when they're not making any money that they have to close the business down. Because um, obviously none of their actors are working. And uh, yeah, and then watching something like the BAFTAs or the Oscars at that time in my life just made me so pissed off and jealous and envious and just like, you know, just bitter, to be honest, just bitter about why I was blaming unconsciously everyone else in the industry for why I wasn't working instead of turning my fingers around and pointing at myself and saying, actually, mate, it's you and everyone else's success is nothing to do with yours. And just because they've won something, it doesn't mean you're not going to get yours doesn't mean that there's less success out there for me than there was for, you know, because they those people on the telly, those people winning BAFTAs had, had won their awards. So I want to play this 60-second clip from Julie because she admits that as well in terms of how envy and jealousy can kind of screw you up. Um, but actually, she gives away what she thinks is the secret to being a happy actor. Um, it's only a minute long, this clip. I'll be back in a minute. But I just think if you can take anything from tonight's broadcast, this is something that's really, really important to implement in your life. In Feb, you Eri, okay? You Eri, here you go. We'd gone out to meet up in London while I was filming Peter Lou, and she kept saying, Oh, what, what are you doing at the moment? And I, and I kept fudging it because I was worried that I knew she wasn't working at the time, and I was worried that, that she'd feel bad. And anyway, in the end, she was like, Oh, did you know they're looking for people for Peter Lou? And blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, I'm filming it at the moment, you know, and she was just like, oh my God, that's brilliant. And when we left each other, I sent her a massive text just saying, I've spent a lot of my life being really jealous of you and your absolute generosity and pure, unadulterated joy for me that I had that job. Yeah. It really shamed me and really made me look at myself again and think like, and she was like, oh, mate, mate, my mate, you know, I'm just happy for you, it's blah, blah. And I really learned wow. something from it. I just thought to be like that, is the absolute goal above anything else, yep. above any other success. It's if you can actually enjoy other people's success and be like, fair dues to you, and really feel that inside you, that is like the secret of happiness in this profession. There you go, little clip from Julie. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And you know what? I'm not going to sit up here and I never like to do this at all and go, oh yeah, I'm perfect. You know, I always celebrate other people's success. You know what, sometimes it's really freaking hard. It's really hard. It doesn't come naturally to everybody, I don't think. Maybe it's just me. Um, but like I say, you know, if, if you are facing adversity in your life or you are seeing other people seemingly, and it's not always the case when you really dig deeper, but seemingly have it easier than you. Um, I remember when I was at drama school and there was a kid two years below me just plucked out of, I think it was the end of his first year, put in a massive Sky Atlantic show, basically didn't finish drama school. Um, and it completely launched his career. Like he'd never auditioned for anything before in his life by drama school. <laughs> and then boom, pulled out and a bigger job than like, you know what, like a bigger role than I've had in 20, in 15 years of leaving drama school, even to this day. Um, and I'm still working on pretty good stuff, but yeah, sometimes it can be like, shit, you know what, it can feel like other people are getting an easier ride or it's like, oh my God, they must know somebody or oh, I bet their uncle's the exec or whatever, whatever. So I'm certainly not saying it's dead easy to always celebrate other people's success. One thing that I know is true from my experience is life becomes a lot less stressful when you can do that. 
and when you genuinely can be happy for other people because like i say it isn't there isn't just 100 units of success out there and if you know if paul goes out and gets a job um you know or lands an agent or something like that you know that that you wanted or i wanted it doesn't mean that there's you know that's it there's 10 units less success out there there's only 90 left now there is you know such an abundance an infinite amount um of success out there uh, you just got to go and, and find your piece of it, you know, and you will have a piece of it out there if you look hard enough. You know, what a lot of people do is they just don't look hard enough. They've got, they, they don't, they don't bring together the two ingredients that I think makes for success. It is very basis and it's, um, it's ultimately hard work and patience, you know. Some people are real hard workers, but they have no patience. So they'll work really hard in spits and spats for two weeks at a time and then they'll just, they go, oh, it's not working, forget it. Other people are very, very patient, but they don't work hard enough. They're almost too laid back where they're like, oh, it'll happen. It's fine. I think you need to bring, marry those two things together. Work very hard every day. Be very quick every day. At least send an email a day, a day or, you know, reach out to someone on LinkedIn a day, on Twitter a day. Do something every day that you can. Everyone's got 10 minutes when they're sat on the toilet. Let's not be too crude about it. Where well, you can compose a quick email to someone, reach out to someone you've not connected with in a while, check in on somebody. Just send a cold email to somebody Um you know, every day to even, you know what I'm going to start doing? Someone someone said they do this, and I thought, that's a good idea. They purposely send a cold email to one person a week, so it's not every day, just one person a week, who is not even in their field, in their industry. So it wouldn't be like writing to somebody in the acting industry. It'd be like, actually, you know what? I'm curious to just learn about something else, and I just wonder what it would be like, I don't know, got in the music industry, or what it would be like, you know, um, I think something completely not related to acting that might be interesting. You know, I mean, I'm, I love business. So going, you know what, wonder what it'd be like to just reach out to somebody who runs their own social media marketing company or something like that. Not directly linked to acting, but I'm still very interested in it. Um, and he was like, it's amazing because you just learn about so many different things that you would never other, otherwise have stumbled across. Um, and he does that via LinkedIn. He just goes on LinkedIn filters by profession or sector you can you can filter like people by the sector they work in he goes oh that'd be interesting yeah i wonder that you know i'd like to learn about banking you know <laughs> i don't know and he just reaches out to someone and goes listen i work in such and such an industry and um, this is the value i can offer you maybe we could spend an hour chatting and just throw some ideas around um and it's just to get educated on lots of different things but i think that's really quite interesting um and everybody's got 10 minutes on the loo to just drop a linkedin message if you're not on linkedin yet Get your freaking self on LinkedIn. Um, I've been banging on about it forever, but it's like absolutely invaluable as an actor. There are so many crew, cat, you know, well, actors, but loads of crew, loads of directors, loads of producers, TV execs, um, you know, commissioners, production secretaries, everything you can think of. They're on Twitter. Uh, not on Twitter. Well, they're on Twitter, but they're on their LinkedIn, I mean. Um, and it, it's so easy to just connect with people, you know. It's gone are the days where you've got to do loads of research to find people, you don't. You just need a very, very quick LinkedIn search or a quick uh, a quick Twitter search and you'll find somebody. Um, Matt Banks is here. Said he's just been cast another theatre production. Fair play, mate. He's always working, this guy. Um, uh, Luke's doing a new showreel scene. Uh, Lucas got his, his first paid acting opportunity ever. Filmed it. It was a short narrative film for a children's commissioner based on how young people feel uh, safe. You're talking about there, yeah? That's awesome, Lucas, though, man. Uh, congrats, mate. Um... I rapped on my first feature, got my first paid VO gig, said Bobby. Already shot a few days in a movie, says Laura. Everyone's just smashing it, aren't they? Good starts of the year for um, for a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, ultimately, that's the first thing I wanted to play out, that clip from Julie. If you want to listen to the rest of Julie's podcast, it's about... It must be getting on for... Uh, let me see. Let me let me see. I'm gonna, if you go onto the website, that's on this.tv, see that little search bar there, just type Julie in it, and it'll be this one. It's called Leap and the Net Will Appear with Doctor Who's Julie hesman Because that's what she had to do, basically. She was leaving the stability of, a, of an incredibly stable job that she could have stayed in at Coronation Street probably for the rest of her life, getting paid very well to do a job she loved, or go out, be curious, leap, take a leap, see if you can do something else in the industry, work in other jobs, and, uh, and hoping the net will appear. It did for Julie, but you'll see the uh, preview of the podcast there. It's like a 10-minute preview you can listen to. The full podcast, though, if I go into the members area... Um, I'll show you what the members area looks like for those who aren't a member. Um, clicking here, here's where all the podcasts are put into sections. So podcasts with actors. Let's click into this one. Where's Julie? 
It's pages and pages and pages. There's literally 200 hours worth on here, guys. So um, you've got a lot to go through if you do become a member. This will keep you company and enhance your acting career for years, literally. Um, <laughs> I mean, you could you could you could binge it all potentially, but uh, that is uh, an hour. Oh, an hour and 17 minutes. So like 70, uh, 70 what seven minutes 78 minutes of julia has but she's awesome she's so so good um so that's the first thing i wanted to play for you guys now the other thing that i think really screws people up and this might have already happened to some people this year um it's obviously the thing that we all face in the industry and just in life in general it's rejection isn't it and i recorded a piece a video on rejection last year that i put out but i don't think loads of you guys on here will have seen it pat good evening how are you doing um so I'm going to play it now. It's five minutes, and it's just some famous examples of people who were rejected but didn't stop. And I know lots of people who have been rejected, and I'm sure they were just about to pop. Something was just about to happen for them in their career, and they did quit. And I'm like, fuck, you know, hopefully the industry will pull them back in at some point. But I just see a lot of people just getting to the end of their tether just before I think something's going to happen for them. So I just don't want that to be anybody on here. So I'm going to play you this. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll, again, we'll come back and we'll, we'll chew the fat about it. But yeah, it's just five minutes, uh, five minutes long. Dwayne says, my career just not long started. And it's amazing. Nice one, mate. Um, Stephen's here as well. All right, Stephen, Mark Scott, Holly Brown says, watched the BAFTAs last night. Loved Whacking Phoenix speech. Delighted Michael Ward, one rising star. Feel so motivated. That's good. Use it as motivation. Ashley Simcock, how you doing? John Moody, Indra, lots of other people are just joining. I'll read the comments as I'm playing this out, guys. I can still see your comments. Please keep making them. Please keep sharing this. Um, whack it into any other Facebook groups that you think would be uh, it would be useful for. Uh, but this is, yeah, just my kind of little take on rejection. Um, why it feels so bad. There's a little bit of science behind this because rejection does sometimes manifest itself as physical pain. That's why if you are rejected, particularly in an intimate relationship, um, it can manifest as real heartbreak as in like you will feel that shit. Um, and then it goes into some examples of uh, of people who got rejected um, but then went on literally to kill it. So it's five, five minutes long. I'll be back. Keep sharing and I'll see you soon, all right? Rejection. It's a b right? As an actor, I've certainly faced my fair share of rejection over the no years. No one would pay to see you perform. On a number of occasions, I've been rejected at like the final hour. You're fired. From projects that wouldn't have only been game changing for my acting career, but actually like transformational for my entire life. So I don't need you then, now. And yeah, rejection at that level really stings. And you might have felt that sting too. And I'm talking literally physically because research shows that rejection triggers the same brain pathways that are activated when we experience physical pain. Scientists suggest the root of this goes back to when we were hunter-gatherers and living in tribes. The price of rejection back then, and thus ostracism from the tribe, was pretty much death. Mother Nature decided the more painful she could make the experience of rejection, the more likely we were to change our behavior to avoid ostracism, thus being able to survive and pass on our genes. Thanks, Mother Nature. So in today's world, there's good news and bad. The good news is that if you are watching this video right now, you're probably not a hunter-gatherer, thus under no risk at all of death if you do get ostracized by your tribe. But the bad news is that even after thousands of years of evolution, rejection still fucking hurts. If you've recently been rejected or you're currently going through rejection in or out of your career, here's a few examples of people who have also felt that physical gut-wrenching punch to the stomach, yet have still managed to come out on top. First up, check this out. It's a rejection letter from a Mr. Jimmy Lena, president of an American record label, rejecting Madonna on the basis she wasn't ready and that he didn't like her material. Less than three years later, everyone on the planet would know this material girl's name. And 30 years later, this woman is still a regular performer at the Grammys, selling millions and millions of albums worldwide. First of all, you have to be really passionate 
about what you do and really believe in what you do because there's going to be a lot of fights and battles and struggles along the way. So my best advice is to really believe and love what you do. Next up is the rather phenomenal actor comedian, Mr. John Cleese, and a rejection letter from the BBC in the early 70s rejecting his idea for a little sitcom called Faulty Towers. <laughs> Ian Mayne at the BBC thought the idea was, quote, as dire as its title, saying it was a collection of cliches and stock characters. This Basil's wife. This Basil. This smack on head. <laughs> which he couldn't see being anything but a disaster. Ouch, there's that physical pain in the pit of Cleese's stomach right there. Don't worry though, that pain soon faded when the show was finally accepted by the BBC in 1975, just 12 months after that letter was written. Today, Faulty Towers is considered the gold standard of British sitcoms. Hardly a disaster, Mr. Main. What I've discovered in this business is that if you do something that's a bit original, yeah. nobody gets it at the start. So you, what you realise, Paul, when you get to my great age, is that almost nobody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Who's this then? Oh, it's billionaire J.K. Rowling, another one who's felt her fair share of rejection. Two decades ago, Rowling introduced us to a universe existing next to our own full of wizards, witches, goblins, and house elves. <laughs> yeah. Harry Potter. Such an honour it is. For younger generations, it is hard to remember a time when Harry Potter, one of the most recognised characters in the history of the world ever, didn't exist. What's even more difficult to imagine though, is a time when the author who created the character struggled to keep food on the table. JK and Harry were turned down by no less than 12 publishers before finally being accepted. And what's even more interesting here is that JK was still getting rejection letters even after the success of Harry Potter, facing many more snubs when she began writing grown-up novels under the pseudonym Robert Galbraith. Her first book, The Cuckoo's Calling, was rejected by numerous publishers and Rowling was even advised to take a writing course. Asked how she kept motivated when things were at their darkest, JK tweeted, I had nothing to lose and sometimes that makes you brave enough to try. I was set free because my greatest fear had been realised and I was still alive and I still had a daughter whom I adored and I had an old typewriter and a big idea. And so rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. The list of those who were brave enough to try is absolutely endless, guys. Everyone from Marilyn Monroe, who was told she would be better off becoming a secretary, to Steven Spielberg, who was rejected from film school, Michael Jordan, who was cut from his high school basketball team, Thomas Edison, who was fired from his job after conducting secret experiments on the side, Walt Disney, who was told he had no good ideas and lacked imagination, and the late, great Steve Jobs, Jobs, who was fired from his own company. Sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love. And that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. Without this rejection and the pain associated with it, would these people have become what they needed to be in order to have the success they were destined for? In my opinion, no, of course not. Okay, remember Mother Nature created this rejection pain within us to get us to change our behavior. So if you're crippled by rejection right now, don't get bitter, get better. Let's change, get up, brush yourself off, go and hit them harder than you have ever hit them before. Build a better you and remember every no you get is one step closer to that yes. Slice alone said it best. I take rejection as someone blowing a bugle in my ear to wake me up and get going rather than retreat. Go get them this week. Bye for now. So there you go. A little bit of insight on rejection. I freaking love so many of those examples, particularly 
the J.K. Rowling one. So she was obviously rejected a shitload of times before Harry Potter was accepted and went on to become like the biggest franchise on earth to ever have existed. But then when she started writing under the pseudonym Robert Galbraith as an adult's author, after all of that success as Harry Potter, one of those uh, rejection letters like actually you know, suggested to her that she should go on a writing course. <laughs> and and she's still had the humility, probably, I'm guessing, because she's a nice person, I think, to not write back. Uh, I probably don't need to go on a writing course, to be honest with you, because um, I'm one of the richest authors probably to ever have lived. Um, so there's some incredible examples in there. So it was just a thing, you know, again, um, to say, you know, this month, another thing to focus on in February um, as an actor is definitely... Um, to not, as um, a few people were saying in the comments there during that, you know, not dwell on rejection, use it as fuel. I don't know about you, but in my own life, in my own acting career, in a way, honestly, it's almost like I don't like, I don't love no's since I'm not saying, oh yeah, what I get a no. But in a way, when I do, and I know that I, I should have got it or I could have got it, or I don't know, I feel somebody is not, you know, not, not, <laughs> I don't know how to say it without sounding like a dickhead. Um, didn't just, you know what, maybe they just didn't see something in me that day, you know, but I felt really right for that thing. And I'm like, you know what, I could have nailed that. And I don't think the person you're giving it to is going to, um, you know, again, I, yeah, I don't want to, you know, no ego involved there, but just like for me, I use it as fuel. There's, there's nothing kind of like better, I don't think, than being judged as like the underdog. I love feeling sometimes the underdog and I love working away very quietly when no one really expects anything from you and then you can just kind of drop it on the industry or you know in the community like a nuclear bomb to go ah okay yeah you were really underestimating me there um i love it in a way there's almost like less pressure on you when people expect less from you so i think you know if you are facing rejection it's all right to have that positive chip on your shoulder in, in a way of going, okay, fuck you then. You know what? I'll see you in 2023 then. Let's see what you're doing. Let's see what I'm doing. It just fuels me to go on. <laughs> um, maybe I'm a bit sadistic and a bit weird, um, but it really, you know, can light a fire in me to go, right, you know what? Sod it. I'll do this. Um, particularly some areas of my life where I've been to play, um, been rejected twice from two massive roles that would have been life changing, like genuinely life changing. One was with a Warner Brothers production in. Toronto late last year. The other one was a BBC production um, that won numerous BAFTAs a few years ago. And I was down to play one of the leads in in the, in the BBC thing and a really decent part um, in the Warner Brothers thing. And it was around, it was all based on an eye condition that I have. And both times it went, it got down to like the last couple of people and it went to the other person. One time it went to someone who wasn't even visually impaired. That pissed me off. Um, and the other time it did go to someone who's visually impaired. I was like, you know what? To be honest, objectively, the Warner Brothers thing, if I'm really objective, I think out of the two people who were up for it, I think he probably fitted it better, to be honest. But there was a part of me on both occasions, particularly after the last one, I'm like, this has happened again, right? This is the universe telling me to stop asking permission to be in other people's shit when it comes to this condition, and you need, Ross, to write your own thing about this because you are the only one who can tell this story and you are stupidly waiting for someone else to write it for you so you can be in it. That's bullshit. You need to get you know, your act together um, and sort it out so that you, know, you write a piece about this yourself, a short film, you know, whatever that is. Um, and that, you know, that, that rejection that I got really was fuel and the catalyst to go, no, stop mucking around, right? One of these opportunities is coming up every five years. Um, stop waiting for that. Make your own opportunity. So uh, rejection can be a really positive thing if you allow it to be. Don't let it floor you if you've been facing it right now, um, and uh, you know, and and demotivate you, and you know, and drain drain that motivation from you. Um, you got to make sure that you do use it. You know, use that positive chip on your shoulder. It's fine. You know, be a kind person, but in business and and you know. I think in business, it's fine to want to just, you know, rip rip the other person's face off. It's fine. <laughs> and I mean, literally, as in like, you know, dog eat dog in business, be kind, be compassionate in real life. Absolutely. Kindness is magic. But when it comes to, you know, creating your own opportunities, be freaking ruthless, demand more from yourself and go out and make it happen. Destroy the competition because you have the power to do that without competing for some with someone else on someone else's project. 
you have the power to destroy the competition by just being and creating your own project. Um, so, uh, so yeah, rejection is a good one. Um, I can see the comments here. We'll definitely watch your film, Ross says John. Thank you, John. Appreciate that, mate. Um, when it when it comes around to shooting it, when I do write it and I do shoot it, um, I'll hopefully get a lot of the acts on this TV community involved in it. If uh, if I can do that at the moment, I have no idea. Um, but that would be uh, would be awesome. Um, Lucas says, I also think that we can build a tolerance to rejection. I feel it at least. I used to be devastated for a day when rejected. Now I get over it in half an hour. Yet it's still important to go through that grief uh, at least a bit. Yeah, definitely. Allow yourself to feel stuff, Lucas. Definitely. Um, as it shows us that we care. Hitting, getting that rejection last year from that Warner Brothers thing, if I'm honest, that was like... That was probably a day and a half for me, mate. <laughs> I couldn't have got over that in half an hour. I text Daniel Edwards, the casting director, um, not of the thing. He's just a, 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 you know, he's become quite a good mate of mine through 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 acts on this TV, and he was like, "Mate, so sorry, go and buy yourself a big bag of Haribo because <laughs> that's what I used to do when I was an actor." So I went out, bought a big bag of Haribo Hearts, and just sat there on my bed, going, "What? How has this happened again?" Honestly. Let's just like dumbfounded going, Ross, you keep allowing this to happen. You cannot allow this to happen a third time. Please, mate, write your own thing. Pleading with myself. So that's um that's definitely, you know, something that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do this year. Ryan Green, good evening, Gina Timberlake. How you doing? Hope you are good. And um, the other thing that I think screws people up, um is opinions, uh, valuing the opinions of other people more than you value your own opinion of yourself. Um, it's really, uh, it's just crippling for so many people. I know because I went through this myself before I started putting, I mean, I've done this for 10 years now. I've been doing a live broadcast every Monday night for years. I've done 400 plus podcasts, 70 odd vlogs on YouTube, so many things. Now. I'm just totally comfortable and okay with putting my authentic self out there. You know what? When I go back and I look at earlier broadcasts, tonight, this is genuinely what you see is what you get. This is me at my most authentic Honestly, no bullshit. You know now I will be like super vulnerable and just honest with everyone on these chats. But I go back four years to when I first started doing these. And even then, you know, putting myself out online, my voice is different. It's almost like I'm presenting, I'm trying to be something that I think you guys wanted me to be or, you know, never showing any chink in my armor, you know, talking all about mindset as if like I'm the fucking guy who, you know, knows all this, so must be practicing it. Whereas now I'm like, yeah, you know, I've studied positive psychology and mindset for years. It doesn't mean I'm perfect at it. I'm just a human being. I know it all. I know what I should be doing. But in some circumstances, I still can't figure out why I'm not. Um, but I go back to some podcasts that I did early on in the day. And you can tell my voice, the way it's pitched, is not me being me. Um, and I laugh at that now. It's quite good, you know. You should a little bit cringe, I think, and be a little bit embarrassed at at the first stuff that you put out online, but at least you're putting it out. And for a lot of people, and maybe there's someone on here, if I can get through to anyone on here tonight, there might be just one person. Aircraft action photos, good evening. Um, you know, there might be one person on here who's desperate to to start creating their own thing, you know, whether that's their own short film, their web series, you know, I don't know, maybe, you, you know, you create music or you're, you know, a photographer or whatever, and you are just not quite ready to throw your hat in the arena and put your stuff out there for fear of what other people are going to think of you. Now, sometimes I understand that because that might be, you know, your parents, you know, who don't want you to be a creative and might want you to be a doctor or something. I don't know. Um, it might be your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife that you are, you know, you're kind of afraid of what they might think of you if you put this stuff out there. Um and that's kind of understandable. The thing that I see more often, though, to be honest, which is surprising, is people are afraid to put themselves out there for fear of what strangers on social media will think of them. What if I put this out and people tell me it's shit? They don't know you. You know, someone who has the time to, say, jump on a broadcast like this tonight. It has happened a couple of times as well. It's quite funny. And actually troll my live broadcast for instance go like ross you look like a dickhead what you know like i don't know just give me loads of shit on one of these someone who has time to do that i'm deeply empathetic to that person because that person must be in a shit ton of pain in their head to have the time to do that so if you are afraid of putting content out there online because you value these opinions of people who are fundamentally broken like it's just a terrible decision to make in your acting career and your life. Um, you know, 
a lot of people will put stuff out for the first time. They'll get 10 great comments. They'll get one where someone gives them some shit and that's it. They won't put something else out again. They won't focus on the 10 great comments. They'll focus on the one comment they got from Sally Pants 50 on Twitter. You don't, who's got no profile picture. Generally trolls. They'll have a stupid username. They'll have a profile picture that isn't even their face. They'll give you shit and you are not putting out content because of that. You know, it's insane. So again, um, I created a piece of content last year that I don't think many people seen. So I want to, I'm going to play it you again now. It's a, about a five minute video again, like that rejection one. And this was, you know, Petch, my cameraman, um, we were filming a piece to camera near Christmas time last year. And we were, we were having a break and we were making a, a, a cup of tea. Petch drinks tea because he's weird. Um, I was uh, making him a cup of tea and he'd left the camera running. So we caught a conversation of me and him. I was, I was, it was really great time actually because he was talking about doing his own vlog. Because you know we do, I do a vlog on YouTube. I'm actually going to finish finish that this year, um, and I'm going to start focusing on some different content. I'll tell you about that another time. Um, but YouTube.com forward slash Watch Ross. You'll see behind the scenes. Um, of all the stuff that we do at actsonthis.tv. So behind the scenes of all the guests and the podcasts that I do, you'll get exclusive chats with them, um, actors, agents, casting directors, etc. If you go right back to when I first started the vlog off two years ago, you'll see behind the scenes of me setting up multiple businesses as well. That was like behind the scenes of my life, not just the acting career. Um, but Petch was like, I want to set up a vlog because he started a self-tape company where he will do your self-tapes for you. If you're an actor and you don't know how to do self-tapes properly, you don't have the technology, he will come to your house literally with kit and film a self-tape for you. So he was like, mate, I want to do a vlog behind the scenes of me doing self-tapes. But he admits at the start of this conversation that he was shit in his pants. And he tells me it's because of a practical reason. And this is what people do because it's easier to say to ourselves, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make that film. I'm not going to put this out or that out because of a practical reason. Like I don't have time. I don't have money. You know, um, people might not watch it. All of these things that are just, um, you know, uh, they're just, it's fear disguised as practicality. It's a real high level of procrastination. I won't do that until I bought the camera and all this shit. Um, and then I kind of talk him through the way I felt when I was first setting up my vlog and I had to take the camera out on my own and set it up in a Starbucks, uh, Starbucks and talk to camera on my own. And I don't know if you've ever done that or you do Instagram stories when you're out and about on your own. Um, you can, if you overanalyze it, get really self-conscious. And in, a, you know, in, a, in the world we live in today, like social media is such an incredible platform for promoting what you're doing like and getting and you know gaining attention and using that as arbitrage to get what you want in your acting career um that you really should be using it all platforms instagram twitter facebook linkedin youtube um you might be so overwhelmed you're like oh i couldn't possibly do that you can um and i'll probably do some broadcasts on how i create content because i'm on all those platforms and i do practically all of it myself petch helps me a little bit the camera guy um but you can do it, you know, if you're disciplined enough, you can do it around other stuff that you have going on in your life. So I'm going to play you this now, um, and then I want some honest feedback and honest, you know, uh, comments from you guys on what you might be holding yourself back from doing because you might be afraid of what other people are going to think of you if you put that thing out. I know people who have filmed stuff, finished it, edited it, put it all together watched it and then their own objective opinion of it not even no sorry not objective their own subjective opinion of it because it's theirs and they're close to it um somehow they decide it's shit and they're not going to put it out and i'm like you've decided that the market is the market the market will decide if it's good or not put it out for god's sake you've made it you've spent all this time editing it and now you've decided it's shit so you're not going to put it out let the market decide so this is like a five minute conversation i had with petch about opinions. I hope it helps. Give me some comments as I'm playing it and I'll be back in five minutes, all right? What are they gonna think of me? I thought, what are they gonna think I'm an egotistical prick or what if I don't get it in one take and I have to keep doing it again and again and again? And I remembered like fearing all those strangers' opinions of myself. I was thinking, I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna do a vlog. You know what you do? Do a vlog, I think everyone should do a vlog. And I was like, well, I, I film yours. So yep. part of it was, I'm gonna have to film this myself. Yeah, you can still shoot a vlog on your own though. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I was doing the washing up and I was, you know, I was kind of scripting it in my head, like, all right, this is what I'll say at the start of the vlog. Um, I can document my way over to to your house to talk to you about setting up that self tape yeah. guy. Yeah, colour of he man. Uh, colour of he man. Is that enough? Like, no, that's fine. Right, go on. 
Uh, so yeah, like I set the camera up. I was even gonna like call you and do the thing that we do, you know, where you have the phone there, like Ross, you're live on the vlog, blah blah blah. I was gonna have it all. Yep. Set up the camera against the table there. We right. were chatting about setting up the business and uh, so people could see me setting it up from day one through to fruition kind of thing. Yep. Documenting is like the thing. Yep. And then I backed out. Why? Like, I don't know. I was just like, oh, You shit your pants. Yeah, no, I really did. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why I did it. I, I was really excited about it at first, and then I was like, oh, do you know what it was? There was like, I'm gonna have to edit this. And then what if I don't do an episode two? Like, right, okay, yeah, yeah. I don't wanna get into the, the habit of just doing content for content's sake. Do you know, I'm, I'm forced. Is that really content. though, why, is that, I don't think that's really why <laughs> you didn't do know. it. I don't know, I, 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 was, I was, yeah. No, that, I think that's you rationalizing why you didn't do it by giving yourself a practice, that's yeah. fear disguising itself as practicality. People do it all the time. People are like, oh, okay, yeah, I can't do it this week because of that, I've got a holiday coming up, oh, I won't be able to vlog that week. You didn't do it, I don't think, because um, you were afraid of, people might think it's shit, or that, or that it might not, you might not be, you know, it's the first, God, it's a bit first vlog you've done. You are good on camera though, but people don't put content out because of fear of judgment of other people, other people's opinions. I remember, one of our first vlogs, I can't remember what episode it was, when you weren't available to film, and I had to take the camera into town when we were doing the documentary at Rabble, yeah. when I was doing the voiceover for that, and you weren't available to like lunchtime or something like that. You'd, you'd got to do a Manuel gig. Yeah, that was, and I, yeah, 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 yeah. I came in the car. Yeah, yeah you had your moustache. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and I remember, yeah, I had to take the camera out, so not my phone, like, you know, the big camera we vlog on, I had to take that out in the morning, on my own as a film like a vlog at the train station vlog on the train on the way and then i remember i had like 35 minutes before i had to go and do that session and i had to introduce the vlog and tell everybody what i was doing and i had it was raining so i couldn't do it outside i had to go into starbucks and i remember getting a brew and having the camera in my bag and thinking shit i'm gonna have to get this camera out set it up on the side and i'm gonna have to talk to the camera in Starbucks, when all these other people are around me, they're gonna think, what are they gonna think of me? I thought, well, they're gonna think I'm an egotistical prick, or what if I don't get it in one take and I have to keep doing it again and again and again? And I remember like fearing all those strangers' opinions of myself. Mm. And then realizing that actually, that thing that I say all the time, that if I don't make my own opinion of myself worth more than the opinion of everyone else in that Starbucks combined, I'm never gonna do anything. Yeah. Because I'm always gonna be vulnerable to those other people and I'm always going to be at the mercy of whether you know like whether or not I think those people are going to like what I do or not and ultimately no one gives a shit I ended up sitting there getting the courage up at my porridge did it to camera I don't think anybody looked at me for more than two seconds they'd glance over and go oh oh okay yeah he's just he's just doing one of them YouTube things or something like that because yeah. they're all wrapped up in their heads they've all got their it was like eight o'clock in the morning nine o'clock in the morning they've all got their day ahead of them They've got their problems at work, their problems in their relationships, they're unfulfilled in this, that, and the other. No one gives a shit about what I'm doing. So, and that's why most people don't put content out because they're just so afraid of what other people might think of them. You know, it was, I, I, it was even coming into Wilmington and I was like, can you remember when we did the vlog downstairs, the first one that we did? Yeah. And Dion came over and yep. stopped Security said so we can't do it. Yeah, and I was like, oh, well, I'm gonna have to walk to Wilmington and, get that with Ross and my camera on records half an hour, then I have to on it. You're just, so what your brain's doing is just go into all the excuses yeah, yeah, about yeah. why you can't do it, as opposed to, you know what, if I did it, then this is gonna build me, uh, you know, brand for my business, this thing, awareness, this thing that I'm, that I'm doing, people are gonna, you know, also build, you know, they're gonna know, like, and trust me because I'm putting myself out online and I'm, you know, you're not doing it to, to go, oh, look at me, I'm doing a vlog because, you know, everyone should look at me, hopefully, and what, what I'm trying to do with every piece of content I put out is going, the people who are watching this are going to be left better than, than I found them before they've seen it. So what value can I give them? And you setting up a business and documenting that whole process is going to be valuable for anybody who's watching. So rather than, you know, think of the three or four people who through insecurity of their, their cells and jealousy and envy and all that sort of stuff might, you know, call you a dick online or say it's shit. Think of those, you know, 25 people who might watch it and be inspired to set up their own thing. Yes, indeed. Your opinion of yourself needs to count more than everybody else's opinion of you combined. In February, 
another thing I want you to focus on. So I want you to focus on celebrating other people's success. It's massive. It doesn't mean that there's any less success out there for you. Um, understanding rejection and how you can use that as fuel to move forward and not allowing it to cripple you. Um, and then that, yeah, not fearing other people's opinions of you. You have to, honestly, it might sound egotistical and in Britain we're shit at this because we're like, oh no, that's big headed. It isn't. Your own opinion of yourself, honest to God, has to mean more to you than anybody else's. There's a there's a podcast I recorded with Daniel Edwards yesterday, the casting director for the co-casting director for Line of Duty. Um, he casts massive, massive stuff. And he says some things in this podcast that are controversial, right? It's three hours and there's definite things that will I mean, yeah, definitely could cause controversy in terms of his opinion. I completely agree with him. But his opinion might not be a popular one amongst certain groups of actors. Um and I had the same conversation with him after this. He was like, you know what? Like, I so believe in what I've said, but do you think it's all right to put that out? I was like, Daniel, you know, there needs to come a point in your life, mate, where you, you know, it being super experienced as well, you know, this just shows that everyone has it. Daniel's one of the most respected people in the acting industry, um, in TV. Everyone has this fear. Um, I was like, Daniel, you need to be proud of your own opinion and realize that to you, it means more than everyone else's opinions. And it's not an egotistical thing. Like it's like, I, my opinion's always right. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you think you are right. Everything I say is based on my own experience of life. And I know that I am not saying that I think I am right, right? And I am more than happy for the people to express their opinions. And that might color mine. And you know what? It's fine to change your opinion as well. You know, I have opinions on stuff that two years ago are not the same as they are today. Um, but it does show you that everybody is scared of, you know, other people's opinions if they're not careful and conscious. But as long as you can feel it in your heart when you're saying it, that you know it is true for you and it's not something horrifically offensive, <laughs> um, then stand by it. It's perfectly fine. Stand by what you believe in because your opinion is just as valid as anyone else's as long as it's not legal. I think. Um, so yeah, they're the three things that I want you to focus on. In February, I'm going to finish the broadcast off by playing you guys a couple of clips of podcasts that I've got coming out and that's on this.cb. I've got one coming out next week and I've got the Daniel Edwards one coming out in two weeks time. Um, but I'll just read a few comments before we start wrapping up. Um, I've seen something great go on here tonight in the comments. Um, Chris was looking for an American producer's um, like contact details but could only find his agent William Morris could only find his agent's uh, details Alex the legend by the look of things has actually found um the producer's assistant's email address his gmail email address so Chris Pan if you're still on here mate um Alex has got um Brockleberry is his name on uh, on Facebook has got the guy's email address n i x a s s t so nick's assist but shorthand n i x a s s t at gmail.com um so yeah don't um don't everyone spam him i don't know what he is <laughs> but chris the producer you're looking for alex has got you an email address there mate this is solid this this honestly i get asked so many questions um about how you find contact addresses for people it's if you if you have a few tools to your toolbox um it's very simple if you go to ats on this tv forward slash casting I've put a free video up on there of how you can get really any casting director's email address um, in the UK industry. Um, I'm sure there'll be similar processes for the US industry as well. Um, but yeah, honestly, Google is your friend, guys. A lot of people email me asking me how to do something that I just don't know the answer to. And within three minutes, I can find it on Google. And like, you know, I'll always do my best. I'll email everybody back. But sometimes I'm like, fucking hell, I'm wasting so much time doing basic work for guys and girls who could just Google it themselves and find out the answer in two or three minutes um there is so much free info out there online when it comes to this sort of stuff so uh, and again linkedin it's where linkedin pays absolute dividends for uh, for contacting people um so uh so cheers for that alex um hopefully chris that's um that's good man um which is awesome and chris has just seen it there he says wow thank you alex awesome um so yeah so i've got two podcasts coming out later um this month for you uh, one is with a duo and um, two actors um dean um and gary gary damer so dean smith and gary damer um you'll know gary he's been in loads of stuff but you'll know him most from remember the film east is east um he was in East is East. He's been in Corrie. He's done quite a lot of other stuff. He does a lot of kids' programs as well. Um, Hotel Trouble, stuff like that. Um, Dean, you'll know from lots of things. He was in Hollyoaks quite a while. 
Um, he's now in Still Open All Hours with David Jason. He's done Last Tango in Halifax. Lots of big shows here in the UK. But these guys host a podcast together on running. They both run marathons, something that I'm really interested in as well. I've been running marathons since 2010. Um, and they have a podcast called Behind the Medal. Dean is very good friends with Ed Sheeran. They had Ed Sheeran on their podcast. I heard that episode and I was like, guys, you've got to come on and chat about this podcast, chat about how it's you know, running has affected your lives and mental well-being for the positive and that's helped you in your acting career. So we talk all about that. Um, and Dean talks about uh, the first time that he met David Jason, Sir David Jason, um, one of my all-time acting heroes. A lot of my acting heroes aren't Hollywood, you know. Like, <laughs> they're all just like old school British actors. Um, but David Jason, Del Boy, God, he's like absolutely up there for me, you know, as one of the finest just actors that we've ever had in this country it really is when you see him as Del Boy and then you see him as Inspector Frost you would have no idea they're the same people yes obviously you know Frost is a lot older but just in terms of a character actor he's freaking brilliant so funny obviously as Del Boy um, so I'm going to play you just two minutes of us talking and now this isn't out yet this is going to come out next Monday on actsonthis.tv for all members of actsonthis.tv you've got this coming um, but this is going to be uh, yeah out next Monday this is just um, Dean talking about the first time he met David Jason, and um, and what an honour David gave him. Check this out. I didn't know you'd done Still Open All Hours. Yeah, man, this year. That's, that's recent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah we, we, I, I shot that in the uh, summer. Uh, it's the first time I'd ever worked with BBC Comedy Department, uh, which has been a dream of mine since I was born, pretty much. Um, I, Me and Gary met doing sketch comedy mm -hmm. in pubs around Manchester. Um, I've written a load of sketch comedy. I've written loads of uh, plays and, and, and treatments that uh, comedy. But until you've done comedy, you can't get into comedy. Yeah. That whole horrible circle. So I'd never done anything before. And I got a phone call uh, from my agent who um, had had a phone call from the casting director. Um, and they said that I was perfect for the part. I read it. Inevitably, it was a nerdy virgin, which is what the BBC <laughs> make me play constantly. Um, so I went down and did it. But it was Ace Man. I mean, you know, you're working with Sir David Jason. You're working He's with... He's honestly one of my... Like, on, on, honestly, you it's know people are like, cool. oh, you know, who you, mm. who's kind of like your acting heroes. Um, a lot of mine aren't Hollywood names. Mine honestly Same. are. Like, David Jason would be one of my absolute heroes in terms of, you know, he plays Del Boy mm. and then he plays Frost and yeah. you're like, shit, I would have no idea these two people were the same mm. thing. In terms of character acting, like, there's just no better. What was it like, like, meeting him and working with him? It was ace, man. I mean, it, it was one of those things. When, when you talk about bucket list stuff as an actor, a BBC sitcom was right at the top. The fact Definitely. that it was at Pinewood Studios as well. On top of that, you've got Johnny Vegas, who Gary has worked with as well. You've got Sally Lindsay. You've got all these amazing people. But Sir David Jason's the lead. Um, the first time I met him, we were at a little re rehearsal studio down in Hammersmith somewhere. Um, and I knew a guy called James Baxter who plays his son in the thing. So yep. me and him were no, talking. Mean, yeah. um, and I was talking to James and David wanders over. And him and he was talking to James about something and David introduced himself. And I said, mate, you've done really well to work with this knobhead for so long. <laughs> and I pointed to, uh, to James. <laughs> <laughs> Which can go one or two ways when you've just met for someone. But I think yeah. I want to make an impression. You know, we're doing a comedy show. And David pissed himself, punched me in the arm and called me a plonker and walked off. Oh, I love it. Rocky, I, went, I mean, that's an honour, isn't it? Rocky, yeah. you plonker. I literally text my dad. I was like, Dad, Del Boy just called me a plonker. Oh, my God. <laughs> what an honour. David Jason. So David Jason, Del Boy calling you a freaking plonker. Um, I would love that. I'd be all over that. And uh, Julie said she learned a lot from David working on set with him, saying uh, he said it's not how much you do, but how you do it that matters. Um, interesting. But yeah, he's such a such an absolute legend. Um, Alex is saying, side note, make sure everyone in the UK after this tunes into Channel 4, Baghdad Central's about to start. Alex, are you in it? Let us know if you are, because we will tune in. Um, I've got one more piece to play, and then I will let you go. Um, this is a piece that I wasn't going to play, because it says on it, that the podcast is available now, right? It's a piece of micro content we cut from Daniel Edwards' podcast. It isn't out now. You can't go and watch it, but I'm going to play it for you guys anyway because you've been here all night and you deserve it. Very interesting take um, from Daniel on... Um, well, I'm not even going to tell you anything about it. I'm just going to let you watch this. Um, it's just... it's just He's so articulate, this guy. Um, really, really good. And um, it's just about enjoying this entire thing a little bit more, particularly auditions and learning for like, I said I wouldn't tell you about it, I'm telling you about it now. Just learning what to take seriously, when it's appropriate to take life seriously and when it isn't, right? And it's not always appropriate to just take everything in this industry seriously because ultimately 
you know, I mentioned it again, I mentioned it on last broadcast, but we've seen how quickly things can change. There was a terrorist attack yesterday in London. Kobe Bryant had his, had, you know, God, that terrible accident. Stuff can happen, man, really, really quick. And you don't want to be worrying about shit that doesn't actually matter. And yes, we all want to have success in this industry, but really there's other things that we, you know, we need to put into perspective sometimes as well. So this podcast is going to be available in three weeks' time. We've got Gary and um, Dean's coming out next Monday. The Monday after there won't be a podcast, but the Monday after that there will be this one with uh, with Daniel Edwards. It's a two hour forty one minute monster. If you are not a member of Acts on This TV, honestly, you know what? Now more and more people are signing up. I'm not just saying this is a pitch, but I will sell it you because I feel if I'm not trying to sell you a membership to Acts on This, I'm doing you a massive disservice. More and more people are now signing up. You know, we had hundreds more people sign up towards the back end of last year. Um, your competition are absolutely getting information and getting an insight that you, you're you going to fall behind. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that as a scare tactic. Seriously, the shit that is, that is shared in these, you know, from Peter Hunt's podcast, from, you know, from Hollyoaks when he did that, so many people have got general auditions with him now off the back of that podcast, off listening to what he said in it, emailing him, telling him about the things he said in the podcast. You know, Steve Connolly, who might be on here tonight, he got a general audition off Daniel, uh, off, Daniel off, uh, off Peter. Um, like three days into the new year, we only put the podcast out, you know, a couple of days before Christmas. Um, this shit works. Alison Saxton landed a job that would pay for like 10 years worth of membership to acts on this. I think people are getting shit twisted and they're thinking, oh my God, 17 quid a month, right? It's £4.25 a week. Let's just get real, right? You might not have money in your life, right? But you've got £4.25 a week. Go to the pound store, buy some shit from the pound store, some one pound DVD. So what I used to do, flip them on eBay, for a fiver each. I did a vlog episode where we went into the Poundland downstairs under my flat, living like a little shopping complex. We spent five pound on five items. I put them on eBay and I made 28 quid. You're not working hard enough. If you've not got four pound 25 a week, I'm sorry, unless you're in a real bad, bad state, um, you can do it. I'm just trying to empower people. I'm not putting anyone down or taking the mick. Like, like genuinely, you can. Um, and this content costs me thousands of pounds to produce, so I can't make it any cheaper. Um, but it really is empowering so many people. Sharon Spink, I even convinced her. Sharon was Sharon. A couple, I, I, like you know, a few weeks ago, you were like, "Oh, I don't think I can afford it. I don't think I can afford it." Um, Sharon signed up for one month and then cancelled, so she didn't pay monthly because you save fifty-seven quid if you pay yearly, and just got a year's membership. And I swear, I got a year's membership works out twelve pound fifty a month if you pay it up front. It's one hundred forty-seven quid for the year. Um, the stuff on here is just gold and there's a reason why I'm working a lot in TV and it's not because I'm magical, it's because I'm acting on the information that I'm I'm putting into these podcasts and that I'm getting from the guests that uh that come on. So um so it's like it's the truth. Um Liz says it's so true, Ross. I've been so much more proactive since I joined Acts on this. Um and Steve said I did and all. Yes, you did, Steve. Um definitely. Um but yeah, you've got to honestly, you just get out of life what you put in and there is no amount of time or money that is too much to invest in yourself right there just isn't and i'm trying to do as much as i possibly can do to progress all of our lives and careers here so um i can't do any more chris stone's just joined i'm gonna play you this i'm gonna finish on this um i'm gonna have to close the comments down now guys so i won't be able to see your comments uh i don't think let me have a look um maybe i will I'll open another tab so I can still just see him for a second. Uh, but I'm going to be back next Monday, 9 p.m. Uh, if you're listening on the replay and you've listened this far in, please tweet me. Do you know what be a mass? Do you know what mean the world, right? Just to help me spread awareness of what we're doing here and to prove people to people that it is legit. Um, it'd mean the world if you would get on Twitter, um, and and just tell people about it. Tell you know, it just just I don't know. Write a tweet. Telling actors what you're getting from the community, how it's affected you, if it has affected you positively, um, you know, and just that, I mean, that'd mean the world because like, you know, I hate selling. I don't like being salesy. And that, like I say, I feel if I'm not trying to get people on board, I'm doing them a disservice because I just know I can expedite your career with this information so quickly. Um, but that would mean the world if you just tag me in a tweet so I can at least say thank you and just tell people about it. Um, that would be awesome. Um, Chris Stone, whilst you're on here as well, I just want to um, remind people, we're going to do a showreel surgery live with chris stone chris stone's an incredible showreel producer i don't get paid to say that um he's done loads of showreel stuff for me i've been in scenes that he's been shooting as well where we did a web series together um the best in the country in my opinion and um we do the single showreel surgery where we do a live broadcast like this 
But rather than me playing clips of podcasts out, we play people's show reels out. So we've had, the last time we did it, when we did a long broadcast, we did an eight hour broadcast, but it had over a million impressions on Twitter. So there's a lot of eyeballs on people's work. Now, I'm not saying it's going to land you a job or anything like that, but you just don't know who's watching it. Um, so we will do that at some point soon, Chris, and then you guys will be able to send us all your show reels. We'll do a live broadcast. We'll send it out, um, and then we'll try and create some kind of you know awareness that we're live, get people to tune in. You'll learn about show reels. Chris will critique your show reel live. Um, he will tell you in his honest opinion what you should change, what you should leave alone, the order of things, whether things should go, be cut, um, all this sort of stuff. Um, he's the showreel doctor on those broadcasts. So we will do one of those um, this quarter, Chris. We'll do it like by the end of March. And so we'll keep you guys posted on that. Um, so to finish, this is Daniel Edwards, a little clip of his podcast. This is coming out in three weeks, remember. It will say on this clip that it's already out. It isn't, uh, but I want to play it to you. Um, thank you so much for being here. It means the world that you spent the time with me tonight. Um, go watch Baghdad Central on Channel 4 for Alex. Um, and I'll catch up with you guys soon. If you've been listening on the replay, hugely appreciate you. Please tweet me, spread the word. I'll be back next Monday. Until then, bye for now. The serious things of the things that happen outside, yep. come in and enjoy the moment. <laughs> The privilege of being given a script and reading words of a character that's been beautifully written and beautifully executed and someone has invited you in because they believe you are going to understand that character and give us something that's going to make that character come alive. What an exciting privilege. Enjoy the fucking 15 minutes. Enjoy it. Yep. Enjoy it. I know it's hard. It's, it, I'm making it sound much more simple than it is, but enjoy those moments go outside into the real world and think of all the politics and the shit come into the casting room and enjoy that 15 minutes of showing off you get to show the fuck off who doesn't like showing, showing off showing off that's you know the, the core of performance yep and it's those actors that come in and enjoy that are the ones who get the gig for me yep and they're the ones that i really champion because i know that they are finding different ways to to express their talent. Um, so I want to be a part of that. I want you to come in and I want you to go out and me be as excited about watching the last episode of Boardwalk Empire. I've never screamed at the television so much in my life in the yeah. last episode of Boardwalk Empire, one of the most astonishing television shows. Um, or something of when they see us recently that just blew my mind and just upset me deeply and triggered loads of things. And the, you know, many, many shows but how amazing, I get to see that with every actor that comes in, I get 15 minutes of that. I get 15 minutes of performance in front of me, live theatre in front of me. Mm. How fucking amazing. What I don't want is 15 minutes of fucking angst-ridden grief. Yeah.